this storm has caused confusion and delay. You have caused confusion and delay. I think you were face prejudice. <laughs> And DeSantis, to a certain degree, has imbibed some of the, like he's demonstrated some of the principles that uh, people like myself and Aaron have talked about. So, you know, the, the, these are positive. It doesn't, like everybody thinks, I think, that uh, elite theory is blackpilling, right, Aaron? But actually, it shows the path of what you need to do, right? Um, although the blackpilling part is when you then realize, oh my gosh, we're up against like, the entire Death Star, right. the entire Empire, <laughs> you know, the, just the yeah. amount of resources our enemies have is just overwhelming sometimes. Um, so The Rebel Alliance was a good example of an organized minority, though, and they did blow up the Death Star, so it's it, not that yes. fulfilling. Well, it is for me, because I'm pro-Palpatine, but we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One more quick question for both of you. Do you think it's the case that the modern man is actually the human who understands elite theory the least? Like, have people historically had a better intuition about these things that has been deliberately sub subverted? You know, have we been educated out of understanding some of this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a really critical part again of of the transition to the total state to the 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 total bureaucratized cent centralized state. You couldn't have achieved this if you didn't explain to people that they have achieved some level of individual autonomy through their input into the government. Uh, the, the idea of self-government has robbed people of the ability to understand how power works. Uh, and that was a really key part of severing the connection between consequences of rule and the actual power of rule. Yeah, I think uh, James Burnham, who was one of the elite theorists, um, he has a uh, he has moments where he really comes at a problem in a different way, and I I think it's in Suicide of the West. So don't quote me on that. But there's this one moment where he's talking about the consequences of teaching everybody. To, your kind of liberal assumption is like, well, it's probably good that people can read and write, and you know, mass education is a great thing. And he's just like, this made it easier to propagandize people. <laughs> so it's just like the actual consequence of mass education. Like he mm. saw it back then in like 1940 or whatever, uh, or mm. 1960, that it just makes it easier to get a lot of people to think in the certain, you know, easier to sell newspapers to, easier to propagandize. And I think the um, the television only magnified that. Uh, mm. And uh, in fact, the internet, the internet in many ways, uh, I mean, this is a point many people have made. I mean, it has blown apart their messaging a little bit that's why all of us are here mm. um and it's taken let's just say the empire a couple of years to figure out how to deal with this um and now they're regrouping and regaining control over the messaging and so on um so we need to you know we need to uh what do they call it make hay while the sun shines we need to mm. still exploit this little opportunity that we've got before they shut it down completely which they will do eventually, uh, if we let the them. internet was like the little unprotected thermal exhaust port on the east side that uh, gave a yeah. little window of hope. I mean, the, the, the most the most optimistic take is that it's the Gutenberg press versus the Catholic Church, right? Uh, mm. And that there's never put they're never going to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, mm. Optimism I had around that has kind of been put to bed by COVID and Ukraine a little bit, to be honest, because mm. their, their ability, the media's ability to reprogram people in real time is just remarkable. Just remarkable. Mm. But luckily, we you know have plenty of practice bullseyeing womp rats back home, so it's, it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <much of trouble. laughs> Amazing. All right. Th thanks so much for joining me, Aaron. All right. Uh, that, thanks that for having me. See excellent. you guys. Excellent. All right. Hey, hey, I'm now regretting not picking Star Wars as as the topic to talk with you about. <laughs> I know, but I've been doing um, shorts on Star Wars. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I I think w w there is there's got to be some some chunky Star Wars streams on your channel at some point. But uh, I picked yeah. postmodernism because it's actually something I very much want to <laughs> hear your thoughts about. Um, mm -hmm. It's a topic I find interesting, but I also think lots of the people who talk about it, either the rest of their worldview is completely messed up or they don't know what they're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. where, whereas you are both um, sensible you know, centered and informed. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing we have to do when we talk about postmodernism is um, differentiate. I think there's a habit on the quote unquote right to basically just call postmodernism like all left wing thought since 1960 or something like that, right? Uh, like the postmodern well, left or something Peterson's like that. approach. Yeah, you know, the cultural Marxist and all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. It's not quite as straightforward as that. Uh, the first thing we have to do is, like, well, what is modernism? Before we talk about postmodernism, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the modernists were guys generally writing in the first half of the 20th century in literature. It was people like T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound in... Um, in uh, I mean, you can pick you can pick whatever field you want. There were modernists in art. There were modernists in, you know, various different fields. Uh, yeah. Literature is the one I know. Literature is the one I know best, right? Uh, Wyndham Lewis was a modernist. Uh, we've done a number of streams on modernism in art on on uh, on the deepest law on my channel. Um, and what modernism was was a kind of attempt to um, understand and to come to terms with the kind of alienistic experiences of living in modernity, right? If that makes any sense. Where mm. um, modernity is kind of scary and it's new and people feel small in the, in the, in the new mass consumerist age, right? If you, if you, if you read a poem like um, T.S. Eliot's, uh, you know, the, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock or, um, uh, you know, the wasteland, it's, it is, it's trying to find a language to express what it means to be in this modern world, right? But it doesn't necessarily reject that modern world. Um, and in some cases, uh, depending on what flavor of modernist you get, there's a kind of embrace, you know, like the futurists, for example, embraced the technology and they were like onwards and upwards type thing. Um, but regardless of what type of modernist you got, for example, T.S. Eliot was a Christian, um, you know, and uh, he still believed there was a God, and still believed in capital T truth. Um, regardless of which flavor you had of modernist, they still believed in big truth, right? Whether it's God, whether it's science, science, um, <laughs> whether it's uh, progress, capital P progress. It doesn't, I mean, you understand what I'm saying, right? It, it, it kind of wasn't yet so cynical and so disillusioned that it did away with um these kind of grand meta narratives i guess you'd call them about the world right so, um, so they're like wiggers wiggish ideas thing, i mean it, it, does, it doesn't like you could have a modernism which has a wiggish form you could have a modernism that has a christian flavor you could have a modernism that has even a fascist flavor right but but the point is that regardless of which style of modernism it is it still believes there's such a thing as truth, a, a, mm. a big truth out there. And we're trying to find it, mm -hmm. right? We're all in this together, guys, and we're trying to find this truth. Um, you know, maybe the fascists wouldn't say that we're, we're all in it together, guys, part, you know, but we Italians are going to find the truth or whatever. Um, mm. And and we, we embrace the future. So there's a kind of, um, even though in modernism, you get alienation and you get a struggle and you get a sense of a loss of tradition and all of these sorts of things. You also 
still get that um i don't want to call it naive or wide-eyed it's just a kind of sincere a, a kind of sincere belief that there's an absolute truth something like that okay okay mm -hmm. now postmodernism really comes about after world war ii it's a post-war phenomena right um and uh how can i put this uh so after imagine you're living after world war ii whether you're german or you're jewish or you're or you're british or french or whatever you're just a european and well after world war ii or an american or an american well the germans they read shakespeare they listened to classical music some of them believed in god uh, in fact everybody in europe did and they still pretty much destroyed the place i mean we don't need even need to get into the other atrocities that were carried out you know or the communists for example right the communists they believed in socialism and the future i mean they killed millions and millions of people so after you have this kind of mass catastrophic event which was world war ii which in many ways europe still has not gotten over i, th I still mm. think it dominates our imagination in ways that uh, is not always fully appreciated it's all you're never that far away from world war ii coming up in any conversation i mean there's even a name for it right what's the law yeah the uh, thought terminating thing on the internet um yeah i'll find it but yes yeah it's a, there's I mean, some it, sort of every everyone's thinking about like the, the the popular discussions about what's going on in ukraine is basically couched in world war ii language is this world war ii again yeah are we about it, to see world war ii happen exactly or you know you're never that far away from uh you know the mustache man coming up uh, etc so <clears throat> in such an environment where you have um where you have this catastrophic event that happened that destroyed Europe. You know, in, in, in the case of uh, Germany and France, whole cities just bombed, lost, right? Uh, even in this country, you know, there were uh, places hit by the, by the Blitzkriegs and so on um, that had to be rebuilt. Um, how can europeans after such atrocities have been carried out after such devastation after such destruction possibly go back to believing in the old truths whether the old truths is the, the, the capital g god religion christianity whether it's um whether it's a belief in science and progress whether it's a belief in whatever whatever the flavor of modernism happened to be how can you go back to that because look at where it led right um so there's a there was some uh thinkers um who started to abandon the idea that we should have these uh what they called grand meta narratives a big story that explains all the other stories right like the Bible, for example, is a grand meta narrative. It's a big story that explains all the other stories. Um, or uh, I don't know the uh, the kind of progressive view of capital S science. It's a grand story that explains all the other stories. Um, and so you got you got certain people who want, who then wanted to start to deconstruct and pull apart these grand meta narratives. One of the one of the most famous of them is called Jean-Francois Lyotard. He was a he was a French guy. A lot of them happened to be French. Um, and he saw it as a kind of positive mission in a way to what artists should be doing now and what thinkers should be doing now is basically smashing apart and pulling down and destroying all of the grand meta narratives that have got us to this point. Okay whether it is the grand meta-narrative of religion whether it is the grand meta-narrative of science 
whether it is the grand meta narrative of Whiggish history, for example, every single one of these was now grounds to be deconstructed, pulled apart, shown up, etc. Um, and to be replaced with nothing, which is the, I guess, the kind of existentialist part of it, right? We are beyond grand meta narratives now because grand meta narratives lead to things like World War II, right? Something like that. Um, so this is one version of postmodernism. This is the kind of active variant where it's, uh, where it's um, a kind of active style choice that you, that you now, your duty really as a, as a person now is to pull apart all the, all those things that I was talking about. Um, so that's one version of it. Any, any questions at this point or should we? Yeah. I was wondering how it relates to skepticism. The, the idea that you, you, you just, um, don't believe anything that you're told, you, you, you know, you, mm -hmm. you assert, you need positive proof and you, you refuse to just assent to, to things. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that sort of skepticism really, um, I would date back to the Hellenistic period and to people like, uh, What's his name? Uh, Zeno and various yeah, other Greek. The guy who got his students to lead him around and. Yeah, I mean, I would go back to the to, to the Greeks for that sort of skepticism. Likes of Leotar. Is there an influence there or? No, no. Likes of, you've got to understand the likes of Leotard and various other postmodernists. They didn't really care about like capital T truth anymore. They just mm. didn't care. They just wanted to pull down these other grand matter that they weren't um so, so for example like the new like the new atheist like richard dawkins right is not a postmodernist because mm. he was trying to pull down one grand meta narrative the bible religion christianity whatever right the god delusion as he called it and he was yeah. trying to replace it with another grand meta narrative Miss science yeah, Where, yeah. Whereas, whereas these thinkers in the 60s and 70s, mostly from France, were actually trying to show that all grand mass narratives are, at the end of the day, arbitrary. Even science. And this is, one of the, this is one of the more radical parts of it that could be of interest to some of us today, right? Is that somebody like, I mean, Michel Foucault is somebody I would, in, I would include in this. He was, I mean, he tends to be called a post-structuralist, but he, he's recognizably postmodern as a thinker, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he has a lot of critiques of psychiatry and the, and, and the way that science is used by power. Um, or, or, Le, or Leotard, he, you know, he, he ends up in a position where he's kind of, it's not that he's anti-science, he just kind of shows up what we, we, what we would recognize today as scientism, right? He shows up that as being just another type of religion in a way, which is just as arbitrary as all of the other grand meta narratives that he's breaking apart, you know? Another grand meta narrative might be, um, I don't know, uh, a Whiggish history would be another one, right? Or um, any, it's any big story that explains all the other stories. Commun yeah, you know, even communism, it. right? Socialism yeah. is something that a true postmodernist couldn't be a socialist because Marx is yet another grand meta narrative that is, tries to explain everything, and they don't want that. So it's kind of a it's kind of a uh, I don't want to say it's nihilistic, but it's a kind of a destructive thing uh, that style of postmodernism. But there's another style which I'll tell you about in a minute. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, just one follow up quickly on that. Then is there any of this thinking in the kook sphere or amongst conspiracy theorists? No, you know, the, no, 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 there isn't because the kook sphere, um, they the have their own grand meta narrative, right? Which is mm. that the world is run by a hidden hand, Illuminati, lizards, whatever else, which basically explains everything else. You know, in, in, in the kook sphere narrative, um, uh, there isn't really a war going on between Ukraine and Russia because Putin is secretly working for the, you know, for the hidden hand. They're all in it together. All historical events, including World War Two, are actually the results of the of the hidden hand. 
Um, so, yeah. so are, are there still people around today who strongly are they, are they in the academy? Where where are the modern postmodernists, and do they matter? Um, well, well, I would say the tools of post this style of postmodernism, the the questioning of grand meta narratives and so on, have been disseminated into the into the academy. Um, as part of the kind of general toolkit that is told, that is taught to most students who do mm -hmm. humanities degrees. Um, you know, they'll all do some sort of module where they cover this sort of stuff and they learn how to use these, these skills, right? Um, but what, what has also happened, ironically, is that a new grand meta narrative has kind of risen up and slipped into the void, right? Right. Um, and one of the things I've been very interested in doing is, in a way, using a lot of their toolkit against them, right? I mean, my my boomer truth regime stuff is very postmodern in its deconstruction of the grand meta narratives of the, the post World War Two order, right? The kind of liberal myths that uh, we we tell ourselves. Um, but at some point, the left stopped doing that and started believing in their own kind of, which is all of the the anti-white CRT woke stuff, right? Which a true postmodernist would rip apart very easily too and show to be yet another bullshit. But it wouldn't have been a surprise to say Foucault that once you dismantle the existing meta narratives, whoever's in power is going to reconstruct a new one for the, for their interests. No, I suppose it wouldn't have been, but uh, I guess he died before he saw like the fruits of his own labor. Uh, but I mean, he, he 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 does a lot of very interesting things. Like he's got a book on the history of uh, on the history of sexuality, where he he, sh he shows, um, you know, the kind of constructedness of things, right? But he, unlike, and this is why he is postmodern as opposed to some of, like a Marxist. Like I, I did a couple of essays recently on Louis Althusser, which I put on my Substack. Now he, now he is not a postmodernist because he's still a Marxist, right? That means that when he is um, talking about ideology, he always has in mind that the ideology is going to be replaced with a communist one, right? So he he critiques capitalism, and he shows how it works, and he shows how power functions. But his end goal is always the Marxist order that comes to replace it. Okay. Whereas Foucault, I don't think it had any replacement in mind, right? And I and I, I mean, I don't want to speak for I don't want to speak for him, right? Because obviously he died of AIDS in nineteen eighty three or something. But I feel like if he had been around today, he'd be he'd be engaged in uh, the sort of stuff that we're doing, critiquing the left. Because it's a recognizable power structure that um, needs to be pulled apart. Also, he he supported things. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an example of some something he supported. He what he supported um, the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, which is a, basically a, a an Islamic the theocracy, which was traditionalist in nature. Um, and I guess he did that for his own kind of anti-imperialist reasons or whatever, but um, they don't often lead to conclusions that you might imagine, right? Uh, yeah, I think he was just kind of interested to know um, maybe how, um, like, I, I guess he would look at uh, Iran under the Shah and he'd think, well, these are like Western forms being imposed on an old civilization that won't be able to brook them, right? So it's better for Iran to have its own forms, even if it's coming out of radical Islam or whatever, right? Um, so I don't want to just say, well, you know, someone like Foucault, just an evil leftist, although he did support quite a lot of bad causes, I would say, like <laughs> lowering the lowering the age of child consent. And, you know, obviously uh, he was gay, so he had kind of his own agenda as well, you know, uh, stuff like that. But uh, if, if um, yeah. Noam Chomsky had died in the 90s, 
you would probably assume he would have also been on our side by now. No, right? well, no, 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 no. You see, Noam Chomsky was also a Marxist, you see, or he, he was a he was committed to socialism. And this is really where, um, in fact, it's, it's interesting you mentioned Noam Chomsky because there was a famous debate that took place between Chomsky and Foucault, where you can see in that debate the difference between uh, somebody like Chomsky and a true postmodernist like Foucault, who, you know, uh, I mean, Chomsky had this idea of, um, you know, kind of like scientific ideas about linguistics and so on, where, whereas Foucault was using this, using his kind of, um, he was kind of like breaking it apart and using his kind of po post-structuralist lens to kind of cut through, whereas uh, Chomsky's arguments would be called essentialist in some way. He was arguing there's a human nature that preconditions the sorts of languages we can learn, that there's a kind of language instinct in us, right? Mm. Um, whereas um, for Foucault, everything's about power, you know, everything's about social conditioning and uh, texts upon texts and things like that. So, um, but if you wanted to give the other half of the, yeah. so we've, we've seen the people, the postmodernists who do, do you want to just quickly give a summary of who we've seen so far and then who are the other yeah, half? Yeah. So, so broadly speaking, the definition I've given so far would be, um, I've generally been following the Jean-Francois Lyotard type line. Okay. Although we've talked about Foucault a bit as well. Okay. Um, I want to put Foucault to one side a little bit though, because he is very much a thinker in his own right. Who's kind of unique. And he, he doesn't neatly fit into these sorts of boxes. So if I was to say, like, look at one thinker to define postmodernism, it would be Lyotard in this first sense, okay? Okay. There is also this um, second sense, which is a Marxist definition of postmodernism. Um, the essay that always springs to mind to me is by Frederick Jameson, although... Sorry, Luke, I'm getting old and I can't remember the name of it. Okay. Sure. For somebody like Jameson, okay, postmodernism or the postmodern is actually the name given to this moment in what he calls late capitalism. Okay. Hmm. It is um it is a kind of uh uh, I'm trying to find the words here. Postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism is probably exactly the that's right. That's right, Luke. The, the, that is the book indeed. Um, as he talks about how um, capitalism, um, as it progresses, starts getting less and less about um, kind of like industrial industrial manufacturing and stuff like that are much more about the kind of endless an endless mass reproduction of um of various forms and of its own ideas if that makes any sense right um and it's probably easier to talk in terms of actual examples okay of what jameson is talking about have you ever watched x factor yes right i remember watching an X Factor once, where the contestant was um, doing a rendition of a song by a previous winner of X Factor, right? <laughs> it was like Gareth Gates or something, and they were doing uh, their version of Gareth Gates. Yeah, and on I the panel, and on the panel, there was another former winner sitting on the panel, right? And I, I don't know if you know anything about Cheryl Cole, but Cheryl Cole at one point was on pop idol so she is also yes. right um she she was part of that group wasn't she yeah yeah she was part of some group that was originally on one of those shows well the thing is is that even in the first place pop idol and x factor and so whatever right mm -hmm. um but for frederick jameson even abba or michael jackson or the beatles in themselves were pastiches of previous forms sold back to the masses right so so there's this kind of 
loss of authenticity in capitalism, whereby you just get the endless pastiche version that gets further and further removed from the thing itself. What, why you... is this unique to capitalism? Wouldn't this also have happened in folk traditions? Well, I mean, you see that there is this, uh, how can I say, like a kind of Marxist um, uh, kind of snobbery, I guess, about, about mass culture. Um, so, I mean, even the Frankfurt School has an element of this. So, like, the true authentic object is something like, you know, William Blake making his own books and giving them to his friends or something, right? Okay. It's a unique art object that can't be reproduced. Um, or, um, to answer your question about the folk tradition, they could say, well, that's a living, real folk tradition. That's authentic in and of itself, right? Um, okay. But the Beatles or let's say the Sex Pistols, where, I mean, the Sex Pistols are a very good example, right? Because Johnny Rotten and friends had to audition for their parts in the band. A capitalist is now thinking, how can we create a commodity out of this, out of this art form? How can we take those ideas that came out of original folk forms or these authentic, real living traditions, and how can we turn them into product? And it is this commodification that produces the um, the inauthenticity, the pastiche. And um, in one of his more famous essays, again, I can't remember the name, I'm afraid. Maybe it's in that book that you mentioned somewhere. He says, think about going to Las Vegas. The experience of being in Las Vegas, right? I don't know if you've ever been, Luke, or you've seen it on TV or whatever, right? But oh, yeah, um, yeah. in Las Vegas, you could be like, oh, there's Paris. There's the Eiffel Tower. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. There's the Statue of Liberty. Oh, look, we're in Venice now. But of course, it's all fake. It's all fake, right? It's all a pastiche of those things. It's a plastic version, a plastic replica reproduction of the original object, okay? Hmm. So... There, um, there you can say, uh, <clears throat> there you can very easily see what he means by pastiche, right? That the, that Las Vegas is not real. It's a, it's a fake version of all of those things. But what Jameson then says is that actually what capitalism does is that it, even the real Paris and the real London and the real Venice, okay, um, are a pastiches of our commodified pastiches of themselves. And I don't know if you've ever been to the real Paris, but the Eiffel Tower could almost be like the pastiche of the Eiffel Tower. Hmm. You've already seen the Eiffel Tower a million times on television, on postcards. It's meme to death, right? You've, you've lived the meme version of the thing. So the authenticity of whatever the real Eiffel Tower was is now commodified out of its out of itself. Does that make sense? R reminds me of you're walking in the in nature and saying, "Oh, it feels like I'm in Skyrim." Exactly. That was a very postmodern comment, right? <laughs> and and this is the this is, I guess, the kicker of of Jameson, right? So, for Jameson and for Marxist types of postmoderns, right, it's not an active choice. You're stuck in it. If you, I don't know if you've ever read um, Paradise Lost or Faustus uh, by uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe. In, a, in, in Paradise Lost, Satan says at one point, listen, it doesn't matter if I go here or I go there. I'm in hell wherever I go because it's a state of mind. You can't mm. escape being in hell by physically removing yourself or going into nature or going to a nice part of the world or something where i am where i stand is hell right mm. and what jameson ultimately is saying is that being in the condition of post-modernity as we all are in quote unquote late capitalism mm -hmm. is basically like that you can't escape it 
it doesn't really matter if you go to the Tibetan mountain and you meet the authentic monk. You are a postmodern subject, and therefore you will process it in a postmodern way. And you know, long time watchers, long time watchers of mine will recognize some aspect of this idea in in my in my idea that we're children of the ashes, who basically because we're children of the winter or children of the ashes, basically like can't escape the taint of those ashes. This is really a rearticulation of Marxist postmodernism without the bit about the late capitalism, which I think we can do away with. Um, because you can get there a different way through Spengler and Vico and various other thinkers, right? Um, mm. But this is the the, yeah. the the term late capitalism betrays the Marxist roots because it's a prediction. It, it implies that the, the uh, current era will end. Exactly. And I, I feel like the you don't need to take all the Marxist crap with it. You can just, um, like, for example, um, Michel Foucault, who we mentioned, talked about truth regimes or epistemes, right? In Spengler and in Vico, you can't ever get, like, I mean, I've talked about this before. With the best will in the world, right, you, Luke, cannot embody the 10th century monk <laughs> right you just can't do it yes um it, and it's yeah. absurd to think that anybody can right mm. because you just can't recreate every every aspect of those conditions right um and and likewise you take the 10th century monk and you magically transport him here he also could not like it doesn't matter if he lived here for 20 years he'd never quite acclimatized because it's so alien to him right um so th this i think is a is a profound idea that we need to kind of come to peace with and that that, that is how, why i think the you know i i, I came up with this label postmodern traditionalist when i use it that's what i mean really I, it, you're in the jameson um, camp well, it, i think i'm closer to being in that jameson camp although i do think that the the tools of deconstruction and so on can be useful to us because I also see it as our mission to destroy the boomer truth regime, as I've talked about. So I'm a bit of both. I like, I'm a bit of both. I wield, you know, with my right hook, I've got one and, but it, it doesn't really matter how you box, you're still stuck in it. Um, and, uh, this is why I think that it will take, um, to do what is truly necessary, right? eventually will take a different generation who, who have been born and brought up in very different conditions from the ones that we're used to. I've said it so many times. I grew up watching He-Man and Thundercats and WWF wrestling and eating Chinese takeaways. And okay. All right. I may have had a few trials and tribulations, but I have not experienced the sort of suffering necessary to create the sort of man that is required to do what is necessary one has been historically mm. right and we and i and and i think that the um the image i would point people towards millions upon millions of people out in the streets of uh of uh of rio and of brasilia and all around brazil crying out for a leader and while those people were out on the street, Bolsonaro was sitting in Florida eating a KFC. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, he is a product of his time. We're all product of our time to to, uh, to one degree or another that is inescapable. Um, and it will, you know, to not have that mindset, to not, to not be in that kind of thinking first of, you know, your own stomach rather than your duty to history and your nation. Could have been a hero, but no, he's eating KFC, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's just the mindset. Whereas Napoleon, in you know, faced with, you know, extraordinary circumstances, had a very different reaction. But maybe he only had that reaction because he lived at a time where, where, where he suffered, you know, so... I 
I feel like it's something about both halves of this um, postmodernism that is inescapable. Um, so on on the Jameson side, uh, I remember a, a, vid a video essay that was very formative in my thinking, Everything is a Remix. I don't know if you've ever watched that, but it um, goes through pop culture and shows... I mean, I saw one more recently where it went through Star Wars and showed all the films that it was... Um, Yes. off as it were um which is w w when you understand that then it shows you that the um the quality of art usually is about importing the good ideas that you've experienced rather than creating out of whole cloth but a bit even on a broader cultural scale i mean like half the buildings in london are attempting to look like roman buildings mm -hmm. that are themselves attempting to look like ancient greek buildings mm -hmm. and e even egypt as i understand it the majority of egyptian um ancient egypt as we think of it is really trying to replicate an, a much older kingdom that they were longing to return to mm -hmm. um so so that r revelation about human nature and our reliance on reinterpretation um, I agree with, but I don't have the same <laughs> negative feeling towards it. I I just well em embrace that. There is a you see they do they do talk about this as well though, um, which is like what is the difference between there, there, there's a, there's a writer called uh, Roland Bart who I'm sure some mm. people are familiar with who Definitely talks about the that. difference between readerly writing and writerly writing. Okay. Whereas readerly writing is just the kind of lazy reproduction of something you've already done in a particular genre, right? Whereas writerly writing is creating something new. And his example is Balzac. I don't know if anybody's uh, read him, okay? Um, the problem is, is that in this uh, endless pastiche mode, there, there comes a point where you're just sapped of genuine creativity and newness, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the obvious example to point to in the current time, you know, you mentioned Star Wars, right? Well, Star Wars, which in itself was a pastiche of 1930s pulp, as we all know, and various other serials and things that George Lucas liked when he was a kid. Yeah. Well, that created the this idea of the, the massive movie franchise, right? And now... It's just endless Marvel movies, endless franchises, and, and it's just so uh, repetitive mm. and tiresome and bereft of anything new. Um, and I think that, that is the, that's the sort of thing that Jameson has in mind. So even, mm. even if he says, well, the Beatles in themselves were a pastiche of uh, Skiffle or whatever, we can recognize the spark of something new in, in Beatles, right? Mm, but by this yeah. point, they've been repeated so many times. Mm. They have been yeah. covered and pastiched and so on and so forth so many times that by now in 2023, you know, you you turn on the radio and it's like, oh God, another one of these horrible yeah. songs with, you know, the, uh, the auto-tune vocals and the, <laughs> the, the, the shitty R&B hook and all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is really what the, I mean, both Jameson talks about this and even Oswald Spengler talks about it, where it's like, in a, it's like a kind of death, you're circling the drain. It's like, how many diminishing returns are we going to have before somebody actually starts to do something new again, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. It, 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 it seems like there's a principle where um, things slowly drift back through entropy to match the background noise state you know if if there's a if if there's a standard level of human output that is of low quality mm -hmm. um over time things will return to that level but every now and again there is this um moment of order you know an escape like m maybe it's not an, a complete novel moment but something like the beatles or something like the original star wars is putting pieces together 
to create something that's greater than the sum, the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is almost also the same mechanism that produces new civilizations, perhaps, that uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the entire decline of a civilization is just this ent entropic. Effect. Yeah, um, th there's a guy on YouTube called John David Abert, right? Um, and he is he has done a very long series of streams on Spengler, um, which I recommend to people. It's probably the most thorough look at the decline of the West on the internet anywhere, right? And probably will be, like, I don't think anybody will ever top the thoroughness of the Abert series. But he has, he has a book, um, uh, which is a collection of essays on films and things like that. It's called Cultural Decay Rate, where he believes that you get the, yes, you get the, the long Spenglerian cycles over the course of the whole civilization. But you also get these mini Spenglerian cycles where you get something like, I don't know, the birth of cinema, for example, uh, which has these kind of little high points, but then it too experiences it's, um, it's summer, autumn and winter. And then it's like a straight line down until something else comes along. Um, and he has some very interesting essays in that book on, the history of a uh, uh, film and the history of me pop music and things like that, where uh, he has all sorts of like theories as to why you, you know, why you get these upticks where things, where you get these bursts of creativity and then, and then how they get kind of copied and then tired out and clapped out before they need to be replaced. So kind of interesting, very interesting thing to think about. Yeah. I, I, I wonder is Bart more of the, deconstructionist um the would he be on the leotard side of of postmodernism he was actually uh he was actually um he tends to be thought of as a structuralist stress slash post structuralist depending on which uh era of bart you read so i mean it, it's kind of it's kind of difficult because there are no there are no easy labels for these people because like the word right. postmodern is like a kind of catch-all phrase um mm. but um yeah i feel like he was probably more interested in some of these questions about how do you really create something new um versus just something that's tired and generic you know um because i think that people do have that bias basically where you can kind of tell the difference between like a kind of um, a genre novel, right? That is just kind of all tropes that you've seen a million times before versus something that is challenging, right? Um, I should mention that when it comes to this question, I don't actually know if I agree um, fully. Uh, you know, I, I'm something of a big film fan and big music fan, as you know, Luke. Mm. Um, I, I actually have the view that for all of history, most stuff produced is shit. Um, but in every in every time and in every in in every year, pretty much, you will find some like gems in the rough, like in, in amongst all the rubbish. There'll be somebody doing something interesting somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't really have this idea that there's like necessarily you know you know you, you can kind of point to periods where um there are more good artists and periods where there are less good artists right um but i i wouldn't i wouldn't want to i feel like in my actual reveal preferences and so on i don't really believe that it's a constant spiral downwards when it comes to when it comes to art um but that's just my own like personal view uh, it, uh, mm. I don't know how that meshes with postmodernism, but I, I, I just, I, I just feel like it's a, it's kind of distribution of talent thing rather than, uh, rather than, um, you know, e something epoch defining or something like that. You know, uh, I mean, you know. if the the concept that there is this downward spiral, um from the second group seems like it's in conflict with the disbelief in meta narratives because that is a meta narrative isn't it the the inevitable spiraling of culture 
over time. Yeah, well, I mean, don't forget the, the this is why I, I distinguish between the Marxists and the the Marxist postmodern and the and the uh, yeah the first type. But, uh, but did they did the two groups consider themselves to be at loggerheads at the time? Yeah, I think so. I, th I think um, okay. I think Leotard and Jameson are very commonly contra contrasted and juxtaposed. I don't know if they actually like wrote to each other or whatever, but um, I, I feel like uh, I feel like Jameson in particular would want to pick apart Leotard as a kind of just a product of his time, right? That's what Marxists <laughs> like to do. Um, whereas uh, whereas I think Leotard, if he was approaching Jameson, would do would make exactly the move that you're doing. Saying, "Hold on, Jameson, <laughs> you're imposing a grand meta narrative, aren't you?" Um, so yeah. you know, it's kind of like a different. Imagine two uh, two mages fighting each other. One's coming with fire spells, and the other one's coming with uh, <laughs> water spells or something. You know, <laughs> that's interesting because this term "postmodern" is just thrown around as though it as though it was a group of people who agreed with each other but it's it's literally just all of the things that happened as a reaction to the second world war at least as as you're framing it mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i feel like uh, i feel like jameson would say that it it almost doesn't matter that the second world war, war happened because whatever whatever would happen in a capitalist society you'd end up here is what he would say that this is just mm -hmm. a consequence of living in a mass consumerist society that uh, it kind of strips meaning out of everything and gives you the kind of world of en endless pastiches. Um, I actually don't have the the the, the negative view uh, that a lot that a lot of people have. Like I don't share Jameson's snobbishness, for example, about pop culture. I feel like I was born at exactly the time in in, in you know in 1982 where I can appreciate it all. I love Seinfeld. I love, uh, you know, I love my pop records. I get all the references. I love my Tarantino movies. I'm. Why do I love them? Because they were made for me. We mm. are the children of the winter, right? And this is like winter art, if you want to put it that way. Um, it can speak to me because it speaks to my concerns. It speaks to me now, in a way that. Um, I don't know, listening to uh, the music of the summer may not grab me in the same way. Why? Why can it not grab me in the same way? Because I cannot embody the spirit of that time. It can only come to me as an alien voice, if that makes any sense. Now, this is where some people will disagree, right? Like um, somebody will want to say, no. The eternal truth and beauty of Bach or something, uh, or of Shakespeare, or of whoever you pick a great artist, right? Um, that's gonna that is gonna transcend the time and the place and so on. And I think there's some truth to that, right? There are eternal truths, right? There are things that transcend time and place, and that is why we remember people like this. Okay. Hmm. But also, there is this there's this other part of me that thinks, yes, but you're never going to experience those things in the same way as the original audiences, right? Um, that it, I mean, in in Shakespeare's plays, there are tons of contemporary references that will just be lost on us. They're, they're just lost. Mm -hmm. we, we're just never going to get them, right? Uh, people he's making fun of, little little political jokes that he makes. Like when we can't recover those original contexts, and they were there, right? Um, and it's the same with any. It's the same with anything. The original context is is never. You can never reproduce it. So, in a strange way, it's always the past speaking to us, right? And I I always think like, well, if you approach, if you approach somebody like that, like Shakespeare, um, in a humble way, you can let the past speak to you. And maybe you can learn something from it, right? Hmm. You can never fully embody it because because of uh, because of what I said earlier on, children of winter and so on. Hmm. And, and in much the same way, I reckon if you got a a child of the summer, right, uh, uh, you know, 
but if you got J.S. Bach and sat him down, like, could he get Seinfeld? I don't think he could. I think he would know what the hell was going on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or if you uh, if you played him, I don't know, Philip Glass or something, like, is he really going to get it? I, I don't know. I feel like he wouldn't. I feel like it wouldn't speak to him. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to be absolutist. I'm not saying, like, there's no appreciation of old art possible. But there is a, there's always going to be some barrier between us and them. Um, whereas yeah. when you look at the art of our own time, there is no barrier there because we are the original context. Does that make sense? Um, mm-hmm. And even in my own lifetime, I feel that's been lost. Like I, I feel like Zoomers, Zoomers just cannot experience those things in the same way that I do because they just don't get the, you know, vast number of references that are required to truly get them, you know? Um Ones yeah. that you can, ones that you could never catch up on because we were just surrounded by this stuff. It was just stuff like you'd walk in, you'd walk in, and it was just be on TV or something, you know, or it was just like on a billboard or like you can't re- you can't recreate all of that for someone who was born in like the year two thousand and four. You know, it's just not possible. So anyway, I I, I saw a, a YouTube short format the other day where um, the person was being a zoomer like dancing to their favorite song and saying how great the beat was and then a millennial would come along and say um we, we would say actually that's our song and the, the music would change a little bit and it would be the song that the zoomers song was was sampling and then <laughs> the millennial would then be bashed out of frame by somebody who was a a Zenial or a or a Gen X or whoever, or or even a Boomer, and and they would play then the beat in its original context. I feel like this is a, this is almost like a format that Jameson might make to push his his ideas because um, mm-hmm. it is showing how the context is lost and people in, you know enjoy the thing that's in their moment, but mm-hmm. it's always a a reinterpretation or a reinvention of something that was from the the generation previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you you think then as a summary that the postmodernists actually discovered lots of correct and interesting ideas uh, and we can, we can embrace some of their insights, but we, we don't have to believe them entirely, right? We don't have to, we don't have to import the Marxism. We don't have to import the cult, the, the kind of moral relativism or, or the other social agendas, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, the Leotard side gives us uh, uh, tools that we can use to destroy boomer truth. Right. Um, but that doesn't, you don't have to do, you don't necessarily have to do that in a completely nihilistic way. Which is, I mean, if you had a, if I had a criticism of that style of postmodernism, it's, it's kind of nihilistic, right? They're just kind of, um, uh, there's a thrill of destruction in it and nothing else, right? They're not replacing it with anything. Um, mm. Whereas if you were doing that, obviously, you know, you've still got uh, you, you, you God and Bible at the at the back of your mind or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Let me. But yeah, but but on the uh, on the other side, on the Jameson side. Uh, I, I mean, I do, I do think that it's useful to just know that y- you cannot embody another time, no matter how much you want to, and that will uh, put an end to a lot of larping that we see around the place. You know, um, mm. you you have to at some point come to terms with the fact that we're here in 2023, and um, I see a lot of people who want to take this attitude of. Oh, I just want to. Uh, I'm not going to watch any films. I'm not going to listen to any music. I'm just going to reject the entirety of the culture because, like, it's a little bit paused or something. That's not possible. You can't live your life that way. Mm-hmm. You, you have to. You have to. You have to um, just be realistic about where you are. So that's why. That's why I think it's uh, it's kind of useful to just just embrace that, just to come to terms with it. You know. Anyway, mm. hi, Frodi. You're right. Well, back to this evening now, and in 35 minutes, James Garner stars in The Rockford Files. That's after Film 83 with Barry Norman.
and welcome to Film 83. And why not? I'm Barry Norman. Next year marks the release of Edgar the 14th, the final film in the Edgar franchise, which started all the way back in 1934, where a young director called Morcar started Morcar Studios. And in tonight's special programme, we're going to be looking back at the series, asking ourselves what those films were about, uh, with some quotations from the director himself and cast members as well. We're going to be looking at some of the lore and some of the hidden story behind uh, the Edgar characters. And we're going to be considering why this cult horror franchise, which struggled to do well with both audiences and critics alike has had such an enduring legacy. And why not? Morcar Studios opened in 1930 after Morcar, then aged 18, sold off some old armour that was shaped like an onion. It took him four years to produce and release Edgar and he had a vision of creating a 20 film cycle chronicling the imminent threat to white Protestant America. Edgar was a 17th century vampire and the protagonists in the film, the, the heroic couple, were white knight and damsel who were described as a typical wholesome American couple. Now, Edgar I was Count Edgar von Morcar, born in 1744. He was the heir to a great estate in Austria, and somehow, during his life, he contracted vampirism, which made him immortal until being killed with a stake by White Knight in 1911. <laughs> In 1937, Morcar completes Edgar II with the same core cast, that is John Dee as the villain, Charles Maine as White Knight and Poe the Person as Damsel. And he says that White Knight and Damsel represent the eternal Aryan man and Aryan woman struggling to survive in a hostile world. Star actor John Dee Reputedly unhappy with being made to wear a latex Nosferatu mask in Edgar II, requests never again to have his face covered up by rubber. He said, I am an actor. I have so much more to offer than cheap Halloween thrills. Edgar II is a Nosferatu-like vampire who dwells in a squalid basement with an unexplained pet gorilla played by Semiagog. Damsel is a normal girl 
trying to have a bath in peace, while White Knight is a swashbuckling cowboy. Now, Edgar II was actually Edgar I's son, who was born disfigured, likely due to vampirism sometime in the 19th century and subsequently he was disowned and disinherited by his father Edgar I. He lives on scraps at the edges of society and of course he was killed with a stake through the heart by White Knight in 1922. Yes, big bones, um, wild and, uh, uh, dumb tongues and some food and slam. We do great, we just remember, we do great, we do the bones, um, let's just put some food in the bottom, just don't talk about that, don't talk about that, don't talk about that, don't talk about that, yeah, I'm just don't talk about that, yeah, don't talk about that, yeah, don't talk about that, Irritated by his lack of critical or commercial success, Morcar spends seven torturous years on his magnum opus, Edgar III, which opened in 1944. It featured John Dee as a classic vampire count and Semyagog as a giant werewolf. Audiences were confused by its convoluted plot and sinister ending. When asked why the villains won in Edgar III, Morcar said, We live in a cold world where the heroes seldom win. Look at what is happening in Germany. A man stands up for Europe and his race, and look how the world treats him. Aryan man and Aryan woman have lost. Edgar III is a vampire count who is risen from the dead after an unknown werewolf howls at the moon. White Knight and Damsel are a young couple trying to enjoy a forest getaway where they are hunted by both Edgar III and the werewolf. Edgar III was the grandson of Edgar I. His own father, name unknown, is said to have been killed by Edgar I. Edgar III, meanwhile, was raised personally by Edgar the first as his heir. He killed the original White Knight and Damsel in 1925, but then was later killed himself by Blue Knight in 1948. Now people who have enjoyed the Edgar movies, but perhaps not are its most ardent fans, may have missed the fact that there is not just one White Knight and one Damsel, but several of them throughout the movies. The first White Knight died here in Edgar III. We should have a few notes about the first White Knight. Because the character of the various White Knights and the various damsels changes. And much like in uh, other franchises such as Doctor Who, uh, it's worth knowing uh, the various differences between the various White Knights and Damsels. So the first White Knight is a heroic and swashbuckling hero who is always there to save the day. He's, he has a romantic soul and you can see him as the archetypal uh, hero uh, in many ways. He's confident, he's heroic and he lives up to his name, uh, White Knight. Uh, the first Damsel, meanwhile, who was also killed in Edgar III, 
is the stereotypical damsel in distress. She was pursued and tortured by three different vampires, Edgar I, Edgar II, uh, and of course Edgar III, who eventually killed her. And anybody who knows uh, the subsequent uh, genesis of the series will know that uh, these characters develop and change over time. Uh, the second White Knight and Damsel, as we'll see, are somewhat different. <laughs> now in 1945, since Edgar III, which had taken a very long time to make, almost bankrupted the studio, more car rushed out Edgar IV, a back to basics affair with John D starring Edgar IV, who was a mummy. However, it shocked audiences by casting Damsel as the hero and a hunter who saves White Knight from peril. The film gets a positive, critical and box office response and was the most commercially successful Edgar to date at that point. However, uh, Morcar himself was bitter that Edgar IV received more attention than his passion project, Edgar III, and he lashed out at liberal critics. Uh, and this is a direct quotation from Morcar. He said, no, the film is not about feminism. It's about how, in this hellish world, the Aryan man can no longer play his role such that the woman must act as a man. Edgar IV is an ancient mummy who also controls a zombie minion, played by Semiagog. They ambush White Knight, who is described as a young dandy. Damsel is a swashbuckling adventurer who carries a machine gun with which uh, she uses to, to mow down Edgar IV, the mummy. Now, Edgar IV is thought to be the entombed and mummified son of Edgar III, who was killed by his father because he was not born with vampirism and would not contract it. How he came to be animated is unknown, but he was shot and killed with a machine gun by the second damsel in 1927. Mokar now spends five long years working on Edgar V, which is released in 1950. It is a sci-fi horror set in space with a lavish budget and cutting-edge special effects. John D, of course, plays Edgar V, an intergalactic clown warlord with robot minions. The plot sees White Knight and Damsel turned into space slaves. The opening scene of Edgar V features Damsel once again appearing to quote-unquote act as the man in a passionate kissing scene with White Knight. Although the hero eventually saves the day, liberal critics doubled down on claiming that Morcar was a pioneer of women's lib. The director angrily hit back at his critics yet again. No, he said, the film is a revolt against the modern world, a world where women think they are men and in which technology has run away from the spiritual essence of Aryan man. It is a film that hates the worship of technics, he said. Edgar V is an intergalactic space lord who seeks to abduct young slaves for his own amusement. White Knight and Damsel are a young couple who are deeply in love. Now Edgar V was very likely the son of Edgar IV. His mother sent him away to study with mystics when he was 12 years old. He somehow acquired a spaceship and became an intergalactic space lord. He kidnapped the second white knight and the second damsel, who then proceeded to burn his ship down and killed him in 1935. And it should be noted that the Edgar films are not necessarily set in the year 
that they were made. So this film was released in 1950, but it was set in 1935. Well, I don't know. Why don't I go? But it was better than that. But do you know what? Now, after Edgar V came in over budget, Morcar was forced once again to rush Edgar VI, a much tighter and less meandering effort. The film angered conservatives because the central villain was a lipstick-wearing priest who forces White Knight to dig his own grave. Again, Morcar lashed out at his critics, this time conservative critics. He said, I'm saying that your religion didn't save you. I'm saying the church lost its way. Our society is being torn apart on what the conservatives do. Criticise the one director in this town who isn't a foreign subversive. Edgar VI is a deranged renegade priest who wears makeup and likes to make people dig their own graves. White Knight and Damsel in this film are a loving couple who suffer a car crash. And it is not quite clear whether the events after the car crash uh, happen in the minds of Damsel or White Knight or how they fit in uh, to the rest of the narrative and Morcar has never explained it. Edgar uh, V, if you remember from the previous film, had two sons to two different women and both of those sons were trained as mystics in the same secret temple sect. Edgar VI became a priest. It's not clear if he ever had genuine Christian faith, but nonetheless he was accepted uh, into the priesthood. He wore makeup as a tribute to his father and killed the second white knight. And on that score we should talk a little bit about the second white knight and how he differed from the first one. The second white knight appeared in Edgar IV, Edgar V and Edgar VI. He was less confident than the first White Knight. He needs to be saved by Damsel in Edgar IV, and he is submissive to her, notably in Edgar V, although he does save her from capture in that film. He saves the day. But then in Edgar VI, he is forced to dig his own grave, and m many fans of the film have thought that this scene where the second White Knight is digging his own grave is a metaphor for what Morcar sees as the American people doing to themselves. In 1954, Morcar releases Edgar VII, in which John Dee plays the titular wizard with a crystal ball who turns White Knight into a giant yellow chicken. 
the film's final scenes, which features the giant chicken punching a heavily pregnant damsel, shocked audiences. Morcar, by this point in his career, had developed a crippling food addiction. He was despondent and bitter at the establishment, and when asked about the controversy around Edgar the Seventh, he said, The yellow chicken is you. The yellow chicken is American men who are so craven that they would punch a pregnant woman. Edgar the Seventh is an evil wizard who can cast polymorphic spells through a crystal ball. White Knight and Damsel are a struggling couple who stop off in a cheap and sleazy motel because they cannot afford a better room. The latter is heavily pregnant. The former is suffering from a crippling existential crisis of confidence and masculinity. Edgar the Seventh is the second son of Edgar V and stayed as a pure mystic specializing in polymorphic spells. He caused the third white knight to kill the second damsel in 1936. And speaking of the second damsel, it is worth pausing on how her character differed from uh, the first one. She was feisty and heroic. She killed Edgar IV but is never quite the same after the car crash that we see in Edgar V. And uh, she's definitely not the same uh, after being forced to watch the second White Knight bury himself in Edgar VI. Uh, in Edgar VII, she is pregnant, of course, but very subdued in that film, only to be killed by a polymorphed third White Knight. By 1961, Morcar had lapsed into a deep depression eating more and more, visibly putting on weight. He took seven whole years to complete Edgar VIII, a film which features cross-dressing, cuckoldry, damsel cast as a Nazi, and the first gay kiss in Morcar Studios history and possibly in the history of horror films. Conservatives call for the film to be banned. Morcar defended Edgar VIII which he considered to be his personal masterpiece. And this is what he said. Once again, idiot critics do not understand my work. Aryan man has been feminized, literally turned into a woman and humiliated. His lands are raped by hostile foreigners and women are turned into monsters. And then he continued, Edgar has always been a symbol of the dark outsider, the forces seeking to destroy our people. But in this film, Edgar VIII, he's more like an avenging angel who puts what Aryan woman has become out of her misery. The pathetic cuckold White Knight still tries to save her. Edgar VIII, of course, practically bankrupted the studios as both critics and audiences hated the film and it cost a lot of money to make over seven years. Edgar VIII is a mysterious detective reminiscent of J.B. Priestley's Inspector from An Inspector Calls. Damsel is a neo-Nazi who wears a uniform around the house and openly cheats on her husband, White Knight, who has been feminized by her and is forced to wear a dress. She, of course, carries on with Afro Dude uh, in front of uh, White Knight, uh, before she is killed. Now, in terms of uh, some of the law behind Edgar VIII, very little is known about him, other than that he was very likely the secret bastard son of Edgar VI, that's the priest, if you recall, who had been having extracurricular liaisons outside the church. He killed a third damsel in 1952 before being murdered with a shotgun by the third white knight. This of course means that the third damsel only appeared in one film. She, as a neo-Nazi, was a very nasty character who cheats on her husband and bullies him, quite literally forcing him to be a woman. He washes the dishes in one scene as she watches TV and makes out with other men. He, she is killed, of course, by Edgar VIII.
1963's Edgar the Ninth continued the Nazi theme as John D took up the titular role as a Nazi officer who arrests, tortures, and interrogates both White Knight and Damsel with shocking scenes of violence. Audiences were keen to note that Dee's character appears to wear an American hat, once again sparking controversy among conservatives, especially with memories of the Second World War still not that far away in 1963. Morcar himself said, It's an angry film because I am angry. Yes, the Nazi wears an American hat because we live in a totalitarian state that censors what it doesn't like. My last film they try to shut down and ban because their peanut brains don't understand my art. Edgar the Ninth is a high-ranking Nazi officer in a world where Germany won the war and conquered America. An alternative timeline, if you like. White Knight and Damsel work in an office that is raided by the Nazis who then beat and torture them. Now Edgar uh, the Ninth was the high-ranking Nazi official son of Edgar the Seventh. Uh, and we should note yet again that in the universe of the Edgar films it was Germany that won World War II and therefore ran America and not the other way around. He brutally tortured and beat up the fourth damsel and the third white knight before mysteriously leaving with a briefcase in 1955. Later on in Edgar the Ninth Returns, of course, he is killed by the Blue Knight. In 1964, still staving off bankruptcy, Morcar rushed out the next Edgar film, Edgar the Tenth, his leanest film in years, with John D playing the titular character, a psychopathic killer cop who strangles White Knight to death before drowning Damsel in the bath. Critics say that it's clear that the experience of Edgar the Eighth had turned Morcar against America, to which he responded, of course I'm against America. Who wouldn't be? The police aren't on your side. They serve the money power. They strangle our creativity. When he drowns Damsel, that's Edgar the Eighth they're drowning. That's what you all did to my baby. You did this, all of you. Now, shortly after the release of Edgar the Tenth, Morcar checked himself into rehab and stopped making films for a period of time and gave his blessing to uh, Pharaoh. At that point, he'd just been a henchman, an, an extra in the studio playing monsters and background characters. And he gave his blessing for Pharaoh to direct a series of sequel movies, starting with Edgar the Third Returns. But let's concentrate on Edgar the Tenth a moment. Edgar the Tenth is a sadistic cop who kills innocent victims because he believes the world is no longer worth saving. White Knight and Damsel are a high school couple with their whole lives ahead of them. Now, Edgar X uh, was also the son of Edgar VII. Both the brothers were called Edgar in honour of Edgar V. He was a cop uh, and he murdered people because he believed the USA was beyond redemption. In 1962, he finished what his brother, Edgar IX, the Nazi if you recall, had started and killed the fourth damsel and the third white knight. Which means, of course, that we need to pause on the third white knight to uh, dwell a little bit on his character. The third white knight was a dark and complicated character beset by a crisis of masculinity. After he is forced to kill the pregnant second damsel in Edgar the Seventh, he is feminized by the third damsel in Edgar the Eighth, and by the time we see him in Edgar the Tenth, he is a sad and shell shocked husk of a man. Uh, who is put out of his misery uh, by the psychopathic cop. The fourth damsel, meanwhile, is a strong and determined character who is then brutally murdered uh, by Edgar X in the bathtub. So, in 1966, Pharaoh takes the hot seat, the director's chair, for the first time and makes Edgar III returns with Morcar still in rehab. 
John Dee reprises the role of Edgar III, the classic vampire count. And why not? Semiagog debuts as Blue Knight, who has set himself on a mission to hunt down every Edgar that is still at large and at live in the world. Edgar III, unfortunately, does very poorly at the box office uh, in a climate during which horror was not on vogue because action thrillers were de rigueur, all the rage in 1966, of course. Morcar, meanwhile, still sitting in rehab, absolutely hates the film and denounces it. He says, it's derivative. Pharaoh has no artistic talent. He's just copied what I was doing 20 years ago. It deserves to fail. And so we come to 1967, with Morcar still in rehab, Pharaoh completes another quick sequel, Edgar VI Returns. Morcar, who saw the film from his room in rehab, said, Pharaoh will never understand the reactionary themes of my films. These sequels are as moronic as the audiences who paid to see them. In Edgar VI Returns, the Blue Knight makes the evil priest Edgar VI atone for his sins by making him dig his own grave before shooting him into it. And so we come to 1970. Morcar finally comes out of rehab, and his anger at the world has seemingly turned into laughter. He releases Edgar the Eleventh, featuring John D playing the titular character, a clown who torments White Knight with pranks only to be shot in cold blood by Damsel. The final scene of Edgar the Eleventh causes controversy as Damsel licks White Knight's face. With both Poe, the person, and Charles Maine turned 60, critics decried the scene as disgusting and Morcar refused to take interviews. He did, however, release the following statement to the press. He said, My latest film is about laughing at absurdity so as not to despair in the face of the grim horror that is our world. I am the one laughing and all of you are the clowns. Edgar XI is a maniac clown who raids a high school and then tries to kill all of the students. He is apprehended by Damsel who shoots him dead before licking White Knight's face. Now, Edgar the Eleventh was the son of Edgar the Ninth, and in order to understand what has happened here, we need to pick up on a crucial detail from Edgar the Ninth, which is that in one scene he carries a briefcase which is later exchanged with an unknown officer in Edgar the Ninth Returns. Now this briefcase contained the location of a deep underground lair where Edgar the Ninth had sent his three sons, who were all called Edgar. These three sons were Edgar the Eleventh, Edgar the Twelfth, and Edgar the Thirteenth. Edgar the Eleventh was the oldest of these three sons, and he was raised in the aforementioned underground layer, where he studied his great grandfather, Edgar V, focusing on mastering circus tricks and clownery. 
He murdered a high school student in High Valley School in 1975, and he was then killed by Damsel. In 1971, Pharaoh released yet another shoestring sequel, the quickie Edgar VII Returned, which sees Edgar VII, an evil wizard who can turn people into chickens with his crystal ball, return. Blue Knight is turned into a chicken but kills Edgar VII with a shotgun nonetheless. Now, Morcar once again decried Pharaoh's sequel. The metaphor of the blue chicken in my original was about how Aryan man has lost his way. By having the yellow chicken perform this act of revenge, this dunderhead has undone my symbolism. In Edgar the Seventh Returns, Blue Knight tracks down the evil polymorphic wizard Edgar the Seventh and his crystal ball. Despite being turned into a yellow chicken, Blue Knight is still able to kill Edgar the Seventh with a sawn-off shotgun. By 1972, uh, the effects of the rehab wore off and Morcar's crippling food addiction came back and he became more and more despondent, refusing to work. Pharaoh plugged the gap by pumping out yet another sequel, Edgar the Ninth Returns, as we finally see the Nazi officer find his comeuppance against the avenging angel, the Blue Knight. When Morcar saw the film, he flew into a rage. He said, my original was supposed to say that American society is no better than Nazi society, and in many ways it is worse. Pharaoh is a box thinker. His imagination is completely conventional. Pharaoh, uniquely for him, fired back and said, Morcar needs to understand that we're not in the 1930s anymore. Audiences expect the heroes to win sometimes. Also, I am fixing plot holes that he left. For example, the briefcase from Edgar the Ninth passed on here, and this provides vital clues as to Edgar the Twelfth's backstory. Edgar the Ninth returns, sees Edgar the Ninth following the defeat of his battalion in the Vietnam War, finally send his briefcase, which contains the secret plans to the uh, secret lair. Uh, the aforementioned lair, uh, to its destination before Blue Knight blasts him with his signature sawn-off shotgun. <laughs> now, in 1974, with Morcar still refusing to make another film, Pharaoh directed Edgar the Tenth Returns. The killer cop is now in jail and is stabbed in the back by Blue Knight. Pharaoh has called the Blue Knight an avenging angel, revenge incarnate. Morcar finally snaps when he sees this film. He says, that will be the last of these infernal sequels. I will direct. I will make Edgar the Twelfth. Pharaoh must not be allowed to make another film. Edgar the Tenth was a masterpiece about how the US state has turned against Aryan man. This sequel fails in every sense. Edgar the Tenth returns, sees the killer cop in jail. Blue Knight turns up with a machete and stabs him in the back before leaving. And that is indeed the last of the sequel films. Now, while Morcar did not like the sequel films, what did the other members of the cast think of them? Well, it just so happens that they went to a fan convention recently in which they were asked what did they make of the sequel films as along with other questions and I was going to share some of their answers here. Uh, John D said, first Semiagog was a darling and a joy to work with, always the first on set, always knew his lines and a great professional and not bad looking either. Blue Knight is a great character 
an avenging angel, as Pharaoh calls him. He also said that Pharaoh was a very different director from Morcar. He always worked to the deadline, very workmanlike, kept his eye on the budget. Perhaps he was less creative, but certainly he was easier to work with. And then John Dee said, I really quite liked the sequels. As an actor, I relish the opportunity to revisit old parts and to explore the different sides of the characters. Charles Maine said of the sequels, they were great for me and Poe because we got loads of time off. Haha. <laughs> but seriously, Pharaoh, John and Semi did a great job with those. I was always rooting for Blue Knight because that was most often me he was avenging. Ha <laughs> ha. And then uh, Poe had this to say uh, on the sequels. She said, like Charles said, it was a great time off for us. But despite what Morcos says, I really like them. It's not like every movie has to be an arthouse film. You know, sometimes you just want popcorn, and who doesn't want to see Blue Knight blasting Edgar's head off? And Semyagog, who was also at the convention, said, um, They were my baby, man, and come on, Blue Knight kicks all kinds of ass. You got to see each one as the follow-on from the original. If Edgar VI made White Knight bury himself, then Blue Knight was gonna do that back to him. It's real Old Testament, man. Morcar took four long years to complete Edgar the Twelfth, which was released in 1978. Eight years since Morcar's last film, which was, of course, Edgar the Eleventh in 1970. It featured John D as a pyromaniac with a sidekick called Bunny Boy. High budget and action packed heavy on special effects, some wondered if Morcar remembered he was meant to be making a horror film at all. There was controversy during the filming of Edgar the Twelfth, as Morcar had hired an 18-year-old actress called Saffron and forced her to have breast implants. Then, in her second scene, her character, BJ Cocaine, is sent flying off the side of the building by an explosion. Morcar insisted that all the actors had to do their own stunts and Saffron was badly injured in the landing, breaking her leg in the process. Rather than show sympathy, Morcar raged at her for messing up the stunt and Saffron subsequently quit Morcar Studios immediately after the release of the film. Of Edgar the Twelfth, Morcar had this to say. Don't ask me about the silly behaviour of clumsy children. She has no place in this business. This film is my twelfth masterpiece. Don't despair at the world. Don't laugh at the world. Burn it down. Burn it all down. That's my message. Edgar the Twelfth is a crazed pyromaniac with a giant bunny boy sidekick, played by Semiagog. He launches fire bombs at White Knight and Damsel, killing their young friend BJ Cocaine in the process. However, he is caught by our heroes and killed by Damsel, who then slow dances with an aging white knight. Now, Edgar the Twelfth was the second son of Edgar the Ninth. He was raised in the same underground layer as Edgar the Eleventh. He studied his grandfather, Edgar the Seventh, and mastered both the arts of polymorphy and pyromancy. He killed BJ Cocaine, but then was himself killed by Damsel. He's talking about the percentage, and he said, Mount St. Jesus, I'm saying, have a. Morcar then took five more long years to make Edgar the Thirteenth, with John D, Poe the Person, and Charles Maine, all aged seventy-one by this point. Production was surprisingly harmonious, except for the director, who gorged himself on food, often refusing to come to the set. And immediately after the release of Edgar the Thirteenth, Morcar quit the studio. Um, and requested for his name to be taken off the film. 
Edgar the Thirteenth is set in a jungle, with damsel donning the same costume, the safari outfit seen in Edgar the Fourth, with John D as a mysterious ninja who poisons White Knight. After defeating the ninja in a kung fu duel, damsel sees Blue Knight from the sequel films walking his dog and falls in love. Morcar had this to say on his last film. I wanted my name taken off it. I hate Edgar. I hate John D. I hate Poe the Person. I hate Charles Maine. I hate this stupid series. I hate the film industry. And I only included Kung Fu to show you how stupid you all are. I want to drink poison and die. Edgar the 13th is a ninja who follows White Knight and Damsel to the jungle. He murders White Knight by poisoning his drink. Damsel takes him on a martial arts fight and wins, killing him in the process. She sees Blue Knight walking his dog and falls in love with him. Edgar the Thirteenth was the third son of Edgar the Ninth. He was raised in the same underground layer as his brothers. He studied the fighting techniques of his father and became a master ninja. He murdered the fourth white knight and was killed by damsel at this point it's probably worth pausing on the extensive family tree of the edgars uh, here you can see the first 10 edgars uh, starting with Ed edgar von morcar edgar the uh, first as we as we talked about edgar the second was his disowned son then he had another son whose name we don't know um, who he also disowned and killed, uh, but then Edgar the uh, Third was raised as Edgar the First's heir, and if you remember, his son Edgar the Fourth would not contract vampirism, and so Edgar the Third killed Edgar the Fourth uh, and wrapped him uh, as as a mummy. Somehow, Edgar the Fourth came back alive later uh, in. We don't know how that happened, um, but also unbeknownst to Edgar the Third, Edgar the Fourth's wife uh, hid their son Edgar the Fifth uh, away at the age of twelve. She sent him to train at a secret temple, and uh, Edgar the Fourth, uh, you know, Edgar the Fifth, sorry, remained there until he was older. Somehow he became an intergalactic uh, space lord. And on his travels, he actually married twice. His first wife gave birth to Edgar the Sixth, who then had, uh, it is thought, a son of his own, the mysterious Edgar the Seventh, the Inspector. Uh, sorry, the Edgar the Eighth, uh, the the Inspector from that film. But then, with his second wife, um, he had Edgar the Seventh, the uh, you know the the polymorphic uh, crystal crystal wizard character who then had two sons of his own Edgar the ninth and Edgar the tenth and then as we have just talked through um, Edgar the ninth had three sons himself who were sent to a secret underground layer uh, to be raised in various different disciplines Edgar the eleventh uh, of course was the clown Edgar the twelfth was the pyromaniac and Edgar the thirteenth trained as a ninja and that uh, concludes the Edgar family tree. Now, since we are at this junction, we should also note that there's been another significant death in this film, uh, and that is the death of the fourth White Knight, uh, who's actually been with us all the way from Edgar the Eleventh. The fourth White Knight was subdued, he was visibly aging, and often needed to be saved by Damsel. He has, uh, throughout his uh, appearances, virtually no heroic moments beyond perhaps holding Edgar the Twelfth for Damsel to punch. Generally, he's treated by a plaything by Damsel, of course. In that one scene, she licks his face. In another scene, she kind of pats his backside as they're slow dancing. Um, and then he's killed very quickly in Edgar the Thirteenth. So we reach the present day uh, with the cast set to retire and Morcar gone. Uh, Pharaoh stepped in to 
the director's chair, are to direct his first and last mainline Edgar film, Edgar the Fourteenth. It features John Dee as a ghost who kills White Knight and Damsel, and at the end of the film, the ghost is revealed to be Edgar the First. Morcar only had this to say on Edgar the Fourteenth. He said, "Can't you let me?" Die in peace. Can't you go away and let me die in peace? I want to eat another burger. Fetch me a burger. Get me a burger. Pharaoh, meanwhile, the director of the film, had this to say. The film is about the endless cycle of life. The endless cycle of horror. The series ends as it begins with the rising of a 17th century vampire, Edgar I. I know Morcar hates me in my films, but everything I've done, I have done it for him, and I hope he gets well soon. Edgar the Fourteenth sees the world in flames, cities are in flames, White Knight and Damsel are hunted by a mysterious ghost. White Knight is suffering from a nervous breakdown, and the ghost channels the negative energy from White Knight and uses it to kill both him and, via a mysterious psychic link, Damsel. Her death then resurrects the ghost, Edgar I. Now, Edgar XIV was a ghostly apparition that haunted the fifth White Knight and the fifth Damsel. When they die, he absorbs their life essence to reveal himself as Edgar I. It is said that he needed the blood of ten Aryan heroes, five male and five female, to resurrect himself. So he had five white knights and five damsels, and that was enough to bring Edgar I back. That probably gives us scope now to have a look at the final iteration of Damsel, the fifth damsel, who was the heroine from Edgar the Eleventh until the very end of the series. She was the ultimate evolution of the character, heroic, forward, she took action, she killed all three of Edgar the Ninth's sons, that's Edgar the Eleventh, Twelfth and Thirteenth, and she completely dominates White Knight throughout uh, her films. She falls in love with Blue Knight and eventually she is killed by the ghost of Edgar the First. And this is a good juncture to read some of the quotations from that aforementioned uh, fan convention at which Poe the Person featured. She had quite a lot to say about the series and about uh, her iconic character, Damsel. Poe said this, It was a groundbreaking series. Everyone thought it was just this classic damsel in distress. But as the series went on, Damsel became a genuine action hero. To be doing this in 1945 was revolutionary. Of course, Morcar wasn't doing it for feminism or anything like that, but Damsel is nonetheless an icon. That's what she's become. When asked what her favourite Edgar movie was, she said, for me, it's Edgar IV and Edgar XIII, both of the ones where I'm in the safari suit. To me, that's the essence of Damsel. She's so kick-ass. I don't like Edgar the Eleventh much because he cast me as a schoolgirl when I was 58. I look quite old in that one. When asked about White Knight, she said, Did Morcar make him too weak by the end? Maybe, but he had his reasons. Charles was a brilliant actor. He could go to playing from a masculine, swashbuckling hero to a vulnerable woman facing a nervous breakdown. How many other actors have that sort of range? And then when asked about her own character, Damsel, she said, when you play one character for so many years, people mistake you for the character itself. Many people stop and ask me in the street and say, there's Damsel. And I'm cool with that. I owe my life to it, so why not? Damsel will still be with us in 100 years. And Charles Maine at the same convention uh, had similar thoughts on Damsel. He said... Uh, First of all, let's put the rumours to bed. Poe has been happily married since 1930, and not to me, haha. -ha. But she was great to work with, and Damsel is now this massive cultural icon. I loved her in the safari suit in Edgar IV and Edgar XIII, so similar thoughts. John D, who of course worked with Damsel on all of the films, said, Who doesn't love her? She's feisty, she's kick-ass, as you kids say. Again, I don't like what Morcar did in Edgar VIII, 
But in general, Damsel grows over the 14th films, and by the end, she's undoubtedly the hero of the franchise. But not all the cast members thought the same. This was Semyogog on Damsel. He said, Morkon never intended her to be this icon or anything like that. She's the flip side of White Knight. If she wore the pants, if she came to be the man, she was like an action hero. And that was Morkar saying, look, that's what you're doing to your women. Look, society, that's what you're doing to your women. And that was also a topic of conversation at this Comic Con where they asked each of the actors about the treatment of White Knight. John D had this to say. He said, I always thought it was a shame what Morcar did to the character. He was an empty shell by the end, and I think Charles deserves better. I felt he came to be overshadowed by Damsel. I did not like what Morcar did in Edgar VIII. Uh, Charles Main himself said this, Everyone says he was weakened or emasculated or whatever, but this was Morcar's vision. He was making a social comment. And isn't it true that men aren't what they were? It's a woman's world now, haha. -ha. Uh, Poe said this um, about her uh, co-star, her counterpart, White Knight. She said, did Morcar make him too weak by the end? Maybe, but he had his reasons. Charles was a brilliant actor. So there we go. And uh, Semiagog said this. You've got to remember that Morcar was a dude from the 1930s. He saw the world like a man who had never left 1930. So White Knight was what he saw as the treatment of men in modern society. He wasn't being subversive. He wasn't trying to do anything like that. He was reflecting society back at itself. And so that's a good time to end. I hope you'll join me next time on Film 83, when we'll be talking about Eddie Murphy's starring role in Trading Places. Till next time. <laughs>